How do you acknowledge and deal with the overwhelming times that we live in in education, but also find ways to move forward and to grow through this process? In this conversation with Anik Rock, it's really powerful to hear her vulnerability and humility as she's talking about some of the obstacles that she's overcoming as a classroom teacher and uh, what, what's happening in her world, but also how she shares that she's looking for ways um, to do this. But we have to acknowledge how hard this is. We have to acknowledge how insanely tough this is. And, and, and Nick does a really great job of going through that and, and giving really vulnerable um, thoughts and advice on kind of how to deal with this, but also how to find positive opportunities in this, to find ways um, to move forward this time. And I really enjoyed the conversation. It was great um, to hear from someone who's literally in the classroom while I'm doing the podcast. There's no kids there, but it's a great conversation and, and I really appreciate uh, Anik's perspective and she's got a great blog. And so I hope that you not only learn from her during this podcast, but you connect with her and, and read her blog after it well, or afterwards as well. So. Thanks for taking time to listen. I hope you enjoy it. Hey everyone, it's George Kroos. Welcome to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast. I'm with my friend, Nick Roque, who is a grade one French immersion teacher. I practice saying her name before we go on the podcast to make sure I got the right pronunciation, which is obviously very important. Uh, she's been teaching grade one French immersion. She went from a virtual environment at the end of the 2019, 2020 school year. She's now teaching face to face as we're going into the end of the, uh, the calendar year. And this is being broadcast in 2021. So we're going to talk about some things she actually um, has been working on in the past, but also some of the things that she's looking forward to the future. So Nick, can you just actually introduce yourself and tell everyone just a little bit about your education experience and, and the work that you're doing today? Sure. Thanks for having me on, George. It's an honor. Um, and good job on saying my name. <laughs> I practice. Yeah, you did I good. Good. Uh, so as George said, I am a grade one French immersion teacher in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. And um, this school, I don't know how long I can keep saying that it's a new school. Is it still considered a new school? It's our fourth year. Two years. Two it's years? Over. Okay. It's old school so it's now. Not, it's an old school now. Uh, no, if you're watching this on video, you'll see it is new because every so often I have to like move my arms around because the lights go out because they're on a sensor. So it's still a new school. Um, but yeah, I've been teaching grade one pretty much my whole career before this. Um, I also did grade one French immersion, but it was uh, quite the journey to get here to this new school. And I'm sure we'll talk about it maybe later in the podcast because George had a big hand in that. So that's me in a nutshell. Yeah. And it's funny because we were talking before and, you know, I haven't taught in a classroom, you know, consistently for a long time. And we we're just talking, the lights went off and I was like, that was weird. And then I saw Nick actually just like do this. <laughs> if you're watching on YouTube, the old like get the motion sensor going and I just remember doing that um, all the time. And uh, yeah, I remember actually it was, it was quite fun to be, I was actually there before the school even opened. Right. Yeah. And you know, that, that you think about, you know, where that school was then compared to now uh, and all the stuff that's going on, you know, it's, it's like the school, uh, you have a bunch of people who had actually just dealt with a massive change, like basically everyone's starting from scratch. Um, everyone's new, that massive change, and now you're dealing with a totally new year. But what was it like at that beginning? What was it like when you when you first started that school and like everyone's new to each other? That first year was, I don't even think that overwhelming would be uh, enough to describe that year. It was intense. And like my admin did such a wonderful job getting us together. Like we had um, meetings, we had a retreat before to get the school going, but just all the little things that you don't think about, like um, where the kids, how they're gonna leave to go to recess, where they're mm -hmm. going to, what doors they're gonna come into, where their cubbies are gonna be, all just the little things that you don't think of. We're like, well, we don't have a routine for this. We don't have a school logo, we don't have, um, just so many little things that we had to wing it at the beginning until we kind of figured it out. So that first year was, it was just crazy. 
you know, I remember ta- like I remember talking to you when you're kind of um, coming back, you know, or like we would talk every now and then just kind of hearing about the experience because I was like checking in not only with you, but um, your administrators talking about the experience. I actually remember how overwhelmed you are. And as you're talking about that and you're talking about how important those routines are, you know, at the end of last school year, it's kind of the same thing. Like we don't have routines for, you know, what we're going through right now. We don't have something that's common. So like, how did that experience of like opening a brand new school and, you know, being kind of like totally new, everything's new to you. How did that maybe even did that in any way help you? Or is it just, this is so new. And like, how was that experience comparatively? So I think what was, what was hard was that we already had experienced such a difficult year. Mm -hmm. So we knew kind of how overwhelming that could be, but we also had tools to make sure that we didn't sink with COVID that started last year. What I find is hard is when we opened up this brand new school and we were all struggling, although probably didn't show, we were having a hard time. That was just like our own little school community. Whereas now this is like widespread through the whole world. And I just Mm -hmm. feel for all of the teachers everywhere that are having a hard time going through this because I know how hard it was that first year and um, just having to focus on mental health, taking care of yourself, stepping away. I think my my biggest thing uh, that I learned that first year and continuing now through this pandemic is that good enough is enough like you don't need to be perfect at everything we of course we always want to strive to be the best that we can be but sometimes you just have to be like well this is all i can give this is all i've got left today for my kids and it's got to be enough yeah like i I, i've i've always kind of i've always kind of challenged that notion of like give everything to your kids and like every day like all that stuff um Cause like, and I gave the analogy when I wrote Innovates out of the box was basically if you have a kid in your class who's just not having a good day or is not, you know, meeting the expectations of the classroom or whatever, you wouldn't make them stay there till seven o'clock at night until they got it right. Right. You would say like, Hey, you know what? Like let's, let's start again tomorrow. Let's, you know, start a new day. Um, and then you give them a, a blank slate and then, as educators, we will stay there till 10 o'clock and we will do those things. Um, And often we give our best advice away. Like we give it to somebody else, but don't take it ourselves. And so I think that's a a really important point. I think it's something, um, you know, as an administrator, because I know uh, as an administrator, I, I actually was really on my teachers for not um, being there super late and, and trying to think about like, how could I help them? Uh, you know, when we're doing professional learning, how do I ensure that I give as much time as possible, um, to, to get a lot of that stuff done? Because I don't want teachers having kids do homework all night and miss, you know, being a kid, right? Like I, I talked about this before. But, um, I don't know if you ever seen the movie, my dog skip. It's, it's like my, one of my favorite dog movies ever. But there is this line in it, and it's one of my favorites. It said, we spent our whole childhood wanting to grow up to be adults, and then we spent our entire adulthood wishing we'd be kids again. Yeah. And I think, you know, you only have the opportunity to be a kid once, and I think we have to model that. It's important to get away from work. And, like, I, I even think about how important it is to me that you hire teachers that teaching is a passion, but it doesn't mean that's it's everything, right? And I think you you model that quite well. You You know, you talk about how much you love education, you model it in the work that you do. I know how much you care about children, but you also, you not only, I, I think sometimes, and I'll be honest with you, you don't do this the best yourself, right? Like right. you don't step away sometimes when you tell other people they should, um, but you do that, but you are a huge advocate of people making sure they take care of themselves. And you actually wrote a post recently um, about that and you and I had a lot of conversation. Can you talk about that post that you wrote? And I know that many people resonate with it really. Uh, a lot of people read that post. Yeah, so I think for me, my biggest um, like red blinking light that's saying slow down and if you're doing too much is when education stuff doesn't fill me up anymore or doesn't bring me joy anymore, I know that I've gone too far. Because as you know, I've been blogging for a few years now, somewhat consistently. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and I love doing Twitter chats. I have helped you do iMOOC several times or on the Instagram book study on innovators mindset. And that's all great. But whenever those things, I'm like, oh, it's just another chore. That's when I know that I've gone too far and I need to step away and fill my bucket in different ways. So the, the post, two posts ago, the post that I wrote was, will we though? And that was an answer to the question that teachers or educators keep telling themselves that we're going to come out of this pandemic stronger. And that post was kind of a pushback for me because I'm not so sure that we will. I don't know if stronger is the word that we should use. I'm, some of us won't come out of it at all. Some of us will leave the profession because it's just worn us down too much. Mm -hmm. And those of us who do, do come out of it, I'm not sure that stronger is the word to describe how we'll be after. Will we have learned a lot? Sure. Um, but stronger, I don't know. So then I followed up that post with things that are working well, things that I'm doing that are helping me get through this. And one of the, one of the parts of that was taking care of myself. Another was um, how the, st the students in my class, I'm still fortunate enough to be in-person learning. So the students in my class, they are loving it. They don't know that this school year is any different than it could be. They don't know that we're not doing some of the fun projects that I wish we could because we can't be physically close together. Uh, and then the last part was the connections and the relationships and how I'm so blessed to be connected with educators that lift me up, uh, not only in my school building, but also connected on Twitter and through social media. Yeah, like I, I think about, you know, and we talked about that and there's like, I know that, um, like I was actually running as I know this sounds weird that uh, how is this even connected to this right I was running yesterday and I feel like I'm in way better shape than I've been in a long time and I, I feel really good and I I would finish my run and I I did really well and I was like I'm proud of you like to myself yeah. right and I am so easy to give that out to other people but I, literally, I, it's like the first time I've ever said that to myself, right? And I think that we have to find those moments like, hey, what am I doing well? What am I doing, you know, good? And I know how hard that is because it's like we can be our harshest critics, right? We want to make a difference with with people. And but I also think it's it's important to acknowledge that some of the stuff that people are going through. And I want to point out um, one thing that you wrote in this blog post that really resonated with me. He said, if I'm being completely honest, I'm not sure we're going to make it. Some will certainly fall. Some won't, come up, some won't come out of it, never mind stronger. The sheer weight that educators have been carrying since March isn't easing up. In fact, it is doing quite the opposite. Every day, every change, every new expectation, every pref press conference, every new announcement, every word that is taken back, every time we're told we're putting students first and doing what's best for them leaves us wondering, what about us? And there's a reason I picked that paragraph and we'll link to the whole blog post um, in, the, in the description below. And I think there's a, there's a spe very specific reason why I refer to that part uh, specifically is because I have been notorious and I've caught myself saying, hey, let's, let's, we're always gonna do what's best for kids. We always gotta make sure um, that's, that's where, that's where we focus on is what we do is best for kids. Almost, um, as an administrator, I would say even sometimes and recognizing this myself to the detriment of the adults, right. Mm -hmm. Where in, in trying to like learn from that and be better at that. And so I know as I've matured and grown in my career and, you know, it's a constant learning process that if you really want to do best by kids, you have to take care of the people taking care of children, right? You, that's, that is the, that is like, it's not an either, it's not either you take care of the adults to take care of the kids. It's like, you got to take care of the adults who, who are most closely connected to kids every single day. So like in your experience, uh, you know, and I think a lot of administrators listen to this, what is, what is something that an administrator, like something, couple things, whatever, that an administrator can actually do to ensure that they are taking care of their teachers to, to best help them get through whatever we face right now. And, and to be honest with you, whatever we face in the future, like there, like you said, there, this is a, a situation that's not 
unique to your school. Mm -hmm. But there are going to be tragedies and horrible things that happen to individual schools in the future. And so like, how do you ensure that when through these really tough times for any school right now or, or before or after, how do you make sure that like, what would you tell administrators if you could, you know, have their ear right now, um, how they could best take care of their teachers? So I think two things. I think the first thing that I appreciate so much from my administrators is the constant reminder that we need to and should take care of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And that's sometimes a reminder um, of the importance of taking a mental health day when you need it. And I know that that's something that you've talked to us about too when you were there, how you'd rather somebody take one day and then be their best for the rest of the week than to just drag their feet through the whole week mm -hmm. and not have an amazing day. Sometimes the break is what you need to reach. I, I, did I say that? I can't, I can't believe you remember that, to be honest. I think you I, 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 I've advocated for that, but I, I, that's, that was like four years ago. I can't believe you remember that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that that, yeah, it was yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then the other thing is uh, how, and I've written about this, I know you have too, is how much more educators will do if they feel seen and validated. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes it could just be um, a comment as we're passing, like, you know, as, as my administrators holding the door as we're coming in in the morning, just something like, oh, I saw that you did this and I thought it was great. Or an email or a little note left in your, your, in your mailbox of something that they appreciate that they see that you're doing even if it's not always the best thing, sometimes it's just like, I, I see how hard you're working at reminding students to keep their social distance. Just right. little reminders like that just helps you move on and help you even do more than you thought that you could. Yeah, I think, I, 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 I think, I don't know if you read that or I don't know if I talked about it on a podcast. I know, well, actually I for sure talked about a podcast with Shiresky. Uh, Dean Tresky, we talked about um, asking people, he talked about how he asked people, like, when's the last time you felt validated? Yeah. And it was ensuring that understanding people feel validation in different ways, right? Like I, if you publicly praise me, I am like so excited, right? Yeah. Um, and in fact, I'll complain about not being praised. And then some will do publicly. I'm like, I ah, don't even mention it. <laughs> like, right. it's, it's not like, I'm weird about that. Whereas I remember uh, my assistant principal that I worked with, if you praised her in public, like you might as well insult her. It was just the most, she hated it so much. Um, yeah. She hated that, like she would like a private comment. Um, so I think really that means you have to really know um, the people that you work with. And I think sometimes the easiest way um, is asking them, right? Like, you know, how, how can I validate you to, you know, help you get through this? And sometimes it's like, I don't need a public, I don't need a comment. I don't need, I need you to listen to me when I say this sucks right now and, and not worry that I'm coming off as whiny or complaining. Like, let me just say this sucks. Like, let me just say this sucks. Let me get that out. And I can kind of walk away from that. And I think, as in like, you know, when I work with administrators, it is really important that you don't just kind of do a one size all fit solution for your staff, the same way you'd expect your teachers to know your kids, right? right. Like, I think a lot of times we fall in, we, 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 we give solutions that we don't actually practice, you know, in education, like, we'll say like, hey, we want innovative teaching and learning, but then our PD sucks, right? And like, right. We, we don't, we don't do those things. And one of the things that I, I really appreciate about you when we have these conversations, um, really how reflective you are and how much you refer back to stuff that you've done. And I know that for years, a lot of people read your blog and uh, I, I, I always read your posts because I, I try to read as many teachers that are consistently blog as possible because it, it gives me insights that I don't necessarily have um, right now or good reminders. So that process of blogging, um, tell me like, like, I know a lot of people read it, but like, why do you write it? And what is it done? like, has it actually done anything to help you as a teacher? Yeah, so let's go back to the very beginning. I think that my very first blog post was during your first round of iMOOC. iMOOC. Okay. Yeah. And that first round of iMOOC was my last year at my previous school. 
So it was the year where I was getting ready to apply for this position where I knew I had to step up my game. And honestly, when I started my blog, and if you read my very first post, that's what I say in it is here I am, but I don't know how often I'll be here, but right. I'm already here now. And that's a great start. And then uh, from that point on through the iMOOC, I blogged a little bit more here and there. And I just honestly fell in love with it. Like it just gave me an outlet that I didn't know that I needed. Um, when my boys were young, I, on that leave, I would send like monthly or no, yeah, monthly updates to my family with pictures and stuff, with kind of what was going on with the baby that month. And so I knew then that I loved writing, but when I started writing through iMOOC, and started my education blog and I started writing about what I'm doing in school, it kind of like opened my eyes to what that reflection piece can do. It just forces you to be more mindful of what you're doing and sharing because it's open to everyone, right? So mm -hmm. the pushback that sometimes you and I will, or that you'll give me through text message would never happen publicly on my blog because I'm just so much more careful of what I put out there and more mm -hmm. reflective um, I don't, yeah, I don't know if that makes sense though. Like I, it's not like I want to hold back. I'm just very cautious of how I share things because of how it could be interpreted by others. Right. Well, I, I think part of it too is, um, because I've known you and, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate your work. I will push back on some of the stuff that you do privately and connected. And I think that, um, like I know you're a great teacher and it's not, I push back to you because I think, you know, like I got to fix something or anything like that. But I, I think for me, I look at certain points in my career and I think a lot of people maybe don't realize about themselves is that I felt kind of disillusioned or felt I lost purpose because I wasn't getting pushed because I wasn't getting mentorship in some spaces. Right. Right. And so I think a lot of people that I work with, and it's not like, only I challenge you, you never, you know, say anything to me. I think, I think part of it is I like having some of those conversations in private um, to kind of go back and forth because it makes me try to really think about different perspectives, but I also know how important it is to have someone who like pushes you and challenges you. And I've had this, you know, um, I have a brother in education who will not do the the compliment sandwich, right? He's not going to say like, Hey, here's one thing I like about you, but maybe you should work on it. He'll just say, you suck at this. Right. And like, it's just very blunt and kind of to the point. And as much as I hate it sometimes in the moment, I also know that, Hey, like, is there something there I need to like really think about or, or push on? I think that's what makes you better. But I think when you talk about blogging, I think you going through that is kind of mentorship for yourself in some ways, right? You go through this and it's actually interesting because I pulled up your first blog okay. <laughs> and it's interesting because when I pulled it up, I did not know this, but there's a picture of you um, re with holding my two copies of the innovators mindset. Yeah, It was obviously so good. You're like, I'm not going to read it twice, <laughs> but I'm going to read it in two different books. Maybe I should have like put it in French, right? Since it should do French immersion. Listen, and, uh, don't, don't you remember why I had two copies of your book? No, I'm just going to pretend you bought it twice because you loved it so much. No, but do you remember? No, I don't remember. Because I think that that was our first exchange on Twitter. Oh, okay. And what did I say? Thanks for buying two. <laughs> it was- now, uh, now, I, now I know it's, now I know it's my mom and you bought all three copies. <laughs> it, well, I anyway, drove. Why would you buy it too? Just no. I drove across the city to go pick up the last two physical copies <laughs> because iMOOC was starting, and one of them was for my colleague. And you had said something like, "Oh, well, if that were me, I would just sell it for and make a profit <laughs> because if it was the last two copies, that's that's what that was." And so, really you tried that and realized people are offering you half and they're yeah, like, uh, I, was, yeah, I might as well just give it away. Yeah. So, that's right. Okay. <laughs> so here's actually, I'm going to ask you about this. So this is the last part you write in your very first blog. Uh, so in short, I'm very excited to start actually writing down my reflections regarding all of this. I love how you put this quotations, innovation, education, 
I know that's in quotations talk instead of just spending countless countless hours at night trying to sleep while my brain processes all these cool new things that I'm learning and implementing in my class. I'm not sure what this blog will end up looking like, nor do I know how often I'll be posting, but I'm here now and that's already a great thing. And I love all of this, but I'm gonna ask you, um, so like shifting from, I think this is a 2016 from, yeah, September 18, 2016. So you talked about like, hey, look at all these cool things. Like there's so many cool things, but now, um, I, and maybe I'm wrong, but like, are, are you looking at all these cool new things or do you, do you try to focus on all of these things? Do you try to focus on a couple of things? So like in that one, I think you're looking at like, how do I implement all of these different things comparatively to now? Like, is it the same approach? Do you think differently about that? You know, about innovation and education. <laughs> yeah. Quotations. Yeah, that definitely has shifted. You know, like at the yeah. very beginning, it was like, here's all the things that I'm learning about and here's how I think it could fit into my classroom or here are things that I'm trying. Whereas now it's more like, I'll read something that will spark an idea that will become a whole blog post. It's not necessarily something that I'm working through to then figure out how I'm gonna do it in my classroom. It's something that I read that kind of ties things together that I've been thinking about for a while. Yeah, and I think that's the, like that's one of the challenges. And I'm actually like I'm reading the comments, and it's it's interesting. This uh, Carmen, and I don't know who Carmen is, wrote, uh, "Work life balance is tough. Way to keep innovating despite this challenge." Thanks for sharing. And I think that if you try everything, I don't think you're going to be innovative. I think you're just you know you're you're trying new gadgets and new yeah. little tools. But do you ever really get good at anything? And I think that if you are thoughtful, I'm not saying don't try new things, uh, but I think that if we just try everything, I think it does more harm than good. And I think a lot of people have labeled that as like, oh, they're always on the cutting edge. I'm like, yeah, but they're not really doing anything that deep, right? Like, right. Um, and so I think it kind of does align with work-life balance in the sense that, can I focus on f a fewer things and do them really well, as opposed to trying to do everything and becoming exhausted because like, I, I feel like I don't have any, you know, consistency. I don't have any, you know, things I can fall back on. So like this, I wonder what, like, when you look at this, would you say that right now during this time, um, what, like, would you say you're still, would you still say you're innovating and what, what do you, what would you mean by that during this time? Cause I know yeah. like, I, I'm like totally for us. I'm like, I'm the, you know, I'm the innovation and education guy, quotation yeah. marks, right? I'm totally fine with people just saying, look, I just got to get through this. Yeah. Right. And so like, do you feel you're innovating right now when all this stuff's happening or like, well, how do you look at this? I think that depending on what you consider innovative, right. if, we're, if I'm innovating inside the box within the parameters of COVID. Right. I think that I am, you know, yeah. like I, I had to switch the way that I was thinking. And this is like going to be such a silly example, but at the beginning of the school year, I was racking my brain about how on earth my students in grade one are going to do their choice time or their free time at the end of the day. Cause that is important in grade one. You need yeah. to learn the social aspects. And it also gives me precious time to like work one-on-one -on -one with kids or just walk around and chat and form those relationships. And I was yep. really worried. I'm like, how am I going to do this when kids can't, I can't have four kids playing on a, out of a Lego bin together. How am I going to make this work? And do I, do I think that this is innovative? Probably not, but it was just a way that I had to shift my thinking to make it work where I have 22 bins labeled with different letters of the alphabet and my students pick a bin that they're going to play out of for Monday to Thursday. And then right. Friday has to be free time with Play-Doh so that those other bin, bins of toys can sit for 72 hours so that they're sanitized or COVID free so that they can pick again new bins on the Monday. So yeah, it's not super innovative. Just wait, just wait, just wait. Stop, stop, stop. Okay. Why, why, are you, why are you keep saying that's not innovative? 
Like what, what, what is, what is missing in that element of what you're talking about that you would say, oh, I don't know if this is innovative, like what's missing there. I, Cause I just don't think that it's, um, like a flashy, I, I need to be careful with what I say. Cause innovative is not technology. I like, I yeah. actually, so I'm listening to you and I'm like, no, that is actually innovative. So, so okay. Like I'll, I'll give you an example of why I'm, I'm listening to this. Right. So here's this problem that I have. How do I find a new and better way to actually solve within the constraints that I have? Right. And so you're talking about that solution. Right. And I think this is one of the misconceptions and this is why I talk about innovators mindset, right? We, we kind of equate, like, it's gotta be like some cool and like you even use the term flashy technology before it's innovative. And I think one of the things that I really appreciate about you is that you show you, and you might not even label it this way. You show innovation in the way that you think and the way that you implement ideas. So for example, I might not use any technology when I'm doing like a PD time, but like, how do I use my PD time uh, as an administrator with my teachers when my teachers are super stressed, they're exhausted. Do I just say like, do I, Hey, we're going to do paper instead of computers. No, it's like, okay, how do I honor the issues that they're going through right now? Yeah. So I would actually like, I think it's, I think part of it too, and this is the, the humility of teachers like yourself, not giving yourself credit for saying like, here's this problem. How do I solve this within this situation? But I would say it was very innovative, right? Yeah. As opposed to like saying, I guess they're not socializing, <laughs> which would right. suck, right? So I think that, I, I think this is actually one of the reasons why I wanted to write Innovator's Mindset to kind of show people why how they're already being very innovative. Right. Right. But I think we've just so equated it to the wrong thing. I don't and know. I like, that, I don't know what you think. Like, yeah, I, I, think mean, I know you're was, humble about the stuff you do. Yeah. But I think that what was holding me back was it's not a new and better way of doing things, but it is given in the, the context, fact, yeah, right. In the context, in the, right. Right. Otherwise, okay. So kids are going to play out of the bin by themselves at their spot for 45 minutes a day or half right. an hour. Like that's not, innovative but within like you said within the context it is okay so i'm gonna give you uh i'm gonna give you one of these questions i absolutely hate and see if you can answer it okay oh, okay so right now what's like three things that like what's three pieces of advice you get a teacher like super quick like how they can and remember this is being uh broadcast in 2021 so like what three things that can help teachers take better care of themselves Okay. Uh, I wrote a blog post about this last year. Okay. Small steps. So small steps. Small steps. And what, what do you mean by that? Like, like, so that you can quick get to 10,000 steps quicker every day. <laughs> like, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah you need, I am like obsessed wait. with getting my 10,000 steps. So if that's Listen, the trick, I've if actually been running, just moving my feet the entire time I've been doing this podcast. Yeah, you're running and you're a tall guy. So you need to work on your cadence. If you don't know what that is, look it up. Okay, sorry. Small steps, what do you, like small steps to what? Uh, like it's very overwhelming if you have a huge shiny goal. And okay. sometimes you just need to not even worry about that big thing. Just worry about what's the next small thing you wanna do. Okay, that's one. That's one. You gotta do three. Oh gosh, okay. <laughs> the second thing is, don't worry about what other people are doing for self-care. Worry about what works for you. So that's going to be different for everyone. Okay. And that's okay. All right. You go. Let's even do one more. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Third one for what to do for self-care. Yeah. Third uh, one, just take care of yourself during this time. Take care of yourself during this yeah. time. Um, you don't need to be perfect. Good enough is enough. There you go. That's okay. my okay. So I'm going to, I'm going to build on each one of these. Okay. Great. Well, not okay. Small steps. So I love that. And I actually, I actually wrote a blog post. I don't know if you ever read this blog post. I can't remember how long I, when I started trying to get running again, which is like, a, it's like, it's, you know, I have a love hate relationship with running. I know you run quite a bit. Um, so when I run up hills, I'm a big guy and like you're carrying weight when I'm doing this. And if I like looked up to the horizon and see how far that hill was, I couldn't do it. What I started doing to really help me is I just started looking basically a foot, like five feet in front of me. And I'm like, just get to that five feet. And you get to that five feet real quick. And then all of a sudden you're at the top of the hill. 
And yeah. I think that's kind of what you're saying. Uh, the self-care, I, I really like this. And actually, I can't remember who said this, but it's not my idea. So I do not want credit for it. But I thought it was really interesting. Um, so like the idea of like, hey, like I didn't like teachers being at buildings all night, right? And I struggle with that. But I know sometimes, and this is brought to my attention by somebody who gave me a different perspective. Sometimes some people are there all night because they don't want to go home. There's something going on that they don't want to be, you know, associated with. And so I know this is weird, but the sense that that was some of their self care, right? Um, I found there are certain times in my career where I would work. Um, I would actually work all day, go to the gym for an hour, eat, and then I'd go to Starbucks and I'd work all night. Mm -hmm. And I felt like personally, that was, that was actually a way of me taking care of myself. It might not work for you. It might not have been a good space for you. Um, but just be cognizant that maybe sometimes people are working as a, and it may, am I wrong there? Like, am I wrong no. thinking that? I wrote a blog post about that too. Maybe it was you that gave me that idea then. Uh, I don't know, but it was, um, oh, I wish I could remember the name of the blog post, but it was, it's one of my favorite ones. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Okay. We'll find it. Okay. We're going to find it. But I think I, maybe it was you that maybe that, that got me that idea. See, and that's why I don't take credit for stuff I don't come up with because I don't want someone saying, oh, that was a great idea, George, and then take it away from me. Okay. <laughs> So the, the, the good enough is enough, right? Yeah. I, I would, the only, the thing that I would say with this is when you just, just be, I, I think for me, I know this is like a terrible analogy, but I remember I had a bad breakup and uh, I know it's like, where is he going with this? And I was just really upset about it, blah, blah, blah. And I remember talking to someone about it and I was telling these stories to this person and I was like, God, you're, that was stupid, George. Or like, you were like really dumb at that point. And I felt like I felt, I know this sounds weird. I felt that I like was literally outside of my body, listening to my stories, judging how stupid I was in that situation. And I think sometimes when we are so immersed in the situation, we kind of lose sight of what's going on around us. But I think that if we, I know this, I know this is like, like am I psychic or is there something there, right? Cause it's like, I'm talking about out of body experiences. I feel sometimes I work best when I actually try to go outside of my own body and listen to myself as I'm talking. I'm like, no, that's not actually, that's terrible advice. And I think that, as I said earlier, the best advice that we give often we give away, we don't take ourselves. And I, I think to me, I think we hold ourselves to such a high standard, but then don't hold other people to maybe that standard, or we wouldn't expect that. And it's like, why well, I said high expectation. And this is something, to be honest with you, I have really dealt with myself is I can be very hard on myself to the point of uh, like leads me to depression, anxiety. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm getting better at it, but I appreciate that. Okay. Great tips. All right. So you're in Winnipeg. Yeah. Right. And I'm from Saskatchewan. Okay. Yeah. Um, there is no CFL this year. Who's Hold your... on. We're talking about sports. Okay. Well, I just want to see, well, you're wearing a, a jersey. Are you not? I am because it was sports day at school today. Oh, do you not like, do you not follow it? You just like, give me a jersey, somebody. This is my husband's jersey. Okay. So the, who, who's your, who do you like more the jets or the blue bombers? Uh, so very, I don't follow football. I don't understand football. I don't like football. So I'm sorry. We can't talk football okay, so it's, 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 it's or NFL. <laughs> oh. Okay. Who is the most, who is the most famous person from Winnipeg? Oh my God. Come okay. on. Is there, I know, I know this is a very hard question, <laughs> but listen, you also need to know something there's about so me. many options. Is that why? <laughs> sure let's say that <laughs> Come on, no you need to know something about me i don't know celebrities like if you ask me who is that actor in that movie i wouldn't have a, i don't know people by name not a clue i just i have this very specific question because i have a pick in my mind but i don't know if they're from winnipeg but i feel they're from winnipeg if you ask me i won't know oh okay well was, this game just <laughs> totally flopped okay 
<laughs> is Bird is Bird and Cummings from Winnipeg? Well, there's a Bird and Cummings theater, so I would assume yes. Okay, Bird and Cummings is the lead singer of the what? The Guess Who or the Who? I can always get them mixed up. I think that they're called the Who now, but I think they were the Guess Who. I don't know. Okay, yeah, and he sings American Woman. Yeah, yeah he, and he's. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I think he's from Winnipeg. Let's see. I, I I bet you he is because we have a theater named after him. Was born and raised in Winnipeg. So so basically, you grew up in Winnipeg, and I got that answer. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you got no one. You got no like. Okay. Name. Can you name a famous person from Winnipeg? Everyone from Manitoba is watching this right now. They're all like. Should we let her stay if she can't be one person from Manitoba? They can kick me out right now. <laughs> In winter. Okay, you don't know one famous person from Winnipeg? Is, uh, no. Really? <laughs> one fame like, musician? Yeah. No, no, no. Anybody. Any sport. Anything. That is from Winnipeg. Yeah. Man, you should have. I'll even just say Manitoba now. <laughs> no, it, it won't even help because I seriously, I am so bad at this. You should have given me a heads up. Like, like how I was having Zoom problems before this. Now you're embarrassing me with like my yeah, knowledge just, of celebrities in Winnipeg. And, and the reason I asked this is because I'm from Saskatchewan and Saskatchewan, Manitoba have a r rivalry. I didn't know about it until I left Saskatchewan, to be honest with you. <laughs> But it, supposedly it's a huge rivalry, right? Manitoba, like to be honest, with you, I've been to Manitoba several times. It's like the nicest people ever. Um, oh, wow. see, so you should yeah. cheer for us then. Screw and the Burton Rough Riders. And Burton Cummings is from there. Who I actually grew up listening to Burton Cummings all the time. Not not because I think that he's in a maybe different like age bracket from like what I would have listened to as a kid. But my like older siblings listen to him. So yeah, by default. The, these eyes. Do you know that song? Do no, say some more. <laughs> Fine. Now you're trying to embarrass me? Yeah. What's happening? Yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, all right. Well, I was trying to give you, okay. So this, I'll give you an easy one. Okay. Oh my gosh. What so if this is, this is, this is an easy one because it's personal. So basically, do you know yourself? This is okay. what I'm going to ask you. Okay. <laughs> all right. Um, you run quite a bit and you're like super into running right now. Is that true? Am I wrong uh, still? Yeah, or are you, yeah. are you just lying on the ground? No, I, but I will admit that I've cut back since I finished my half marathon. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. So, um, why do you run? Why do you run? I run for my own mental health. Okay. And like, did you get to that point where you could like break through you know, like where it's like the wall where you like get that really crappy part and, and actually you get, the then you get to the good stuff. Yeah. So I wonder if there's any analogy there for like that right now. Like if this is just the biggest wall that right. we've ever gone through and hopefully we get to that other side sooner than later. Yeah, that's true. That's a good way of looking at it, you know, like endure all of this hard stuff. And then once you push through then and hopefully. it's true like my colleagues and i have talked about this how yeah. think of how appreciative we'll be hopefully by next year when we're back to like what normal looks like in the classroom yeah. and how appreciative we'll be of all those little things that we can't do right now yeah well i know i know um and i think i wanted to have like a frank conversation with you about some of the crappy stuff that's going on too and i appreciate you sharing that it's not like hey like everything's the best and everything's innovative because I think we have to have those conversations too. But I also appreciate all the stuff that you're doing that's going above and beyond, not only for your kids, but for colleagues too. And I know that you're, you're very supportive and I know a lot of people read your blog and uh, hopefully people that aren't, um, that aren't, don't know your work will start reading your blog. Obviously it's not about the history of Manitoba. Um, no, thank God. So, so about education because there's better places, I'm assuming, for the history of Manitoba. Uh, but um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time to do this. But all like thank you for all the work that you do uh, for education and not like not only within your own school, but 
you share and inspire so many people outside of your schools and districts. And I think probably uh, maybe I want, do, I got to ask you this question before I go, do people in your own school read your blog? Uh, do they ever talk to you about it? Yep. What like I had, I had a couple of people come and talk to me after I wrote, will we though, like that dark yeah. pandemic one, a couple of people came in and checked in with me after that one. And my colleagues definitely like my same grade colleagues mostly read it because they're kind like that, but I don't know how many others read it. Yeah. Well, I know I read it and I know a lot of people benefit from it. So, um, I, I look forward to reading more and hearing more stories of running. I can't wait. I'm going to have you on again. And it's just going to be a Manitoba only edition, a Manitoba I'm get only then. <laughs> and how to use zoom. So I'll say goodbye like this. Hey, my light didn't go off once. It didn't go That's off. Weird. You must've been moving your feet the entire time. Anyways. Yeah. Uh, hey, thanks everyone for listening and make sure you, you, you give a, a Nick a follow on uh, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, you'll see the links in the bio and uh, also our blog. Thanks so much for being here and, and being here today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Thanks.